In this video, we're going to talk about pairs and lists in Prolog. So the concept of a pair and a list in Prolog is very similar to what we saw in Scheme. So if you remember how pairs and lists worked in Scheme, then the concepts here should be mostly review. The only difference is going to be the syntax is significantly different. So a Prolog pair can be thought of as two things joined together. And we call the first thing a head and the second thing a tail. So an actual Prolog pair of two atoms, one atom head and another atom tail would look like this, enclosed in brackets, separated by a bar. Here's a pair with A and B. Here's a pair with one or two. And of course, we can have pairs of any two prolog objects. Now, in a rule, when we're unifying with a pair, first off, a variable could unify with a pair. But if we want to unify with the values in the pair, then we give variables in the place of the part of the pair that we want to unify with. So in this case, if we have this structure, then head will unify with A and tail would unify with B. And of course, if we just wanted to unify the head of something paired with B, then we could put B here instead of tail. Or we could do the same thing for B. If we put A here and then had a variable tail here, then that would just unify tail with B if the pair itself had the A or B in the correct location. So I could use the variable names car for the head and cutter for the tail because the variable names themselves don't matter at all. Prolog doesn't care what the names are. It just sees that it's a variable and it handles all variables the same way. There's an internal representation. The actual variable name is something that you see, but Prolog doesn't care about. In fact, there's nothing stopping me from using the variable name vegetable for the head and window for the tail. Any variable names work. So lists, just like in Scheme, are pairs where the tail is a list. There's a special list, the empty list, that's not a pair, but other than that, all lists are pairs. So we can have a list one, two. Notice now they're in brackets with the element separated by a comma, and that is equivalent to the pair one paired with the pair two paired with the empty list. The list ABC would be A paired with B paired with C paired with the empty list. And we could go arbitrarily many elements, as you can see here. Unification for list works just like with pairs. We have a head and a tail. And in this case, H, the head, would unify with A. T, the tail, would unify with the list B, C, D, E. If we have a list of atoms, and again, the variable names don't matter. So here, top value would unify with the atom this, and not a list would unify with the list is a list of atoms. And again, the names don't matter. Even though this variable name is not a list, it's still being unified with this list. Now, if we have a single element list and we try to unify that, then the head will be one and the tail will be the empty list. So we'll use that concept just like we did in Scheme, where our base case will be if we have a list that's the empty list. A variable can also unify with the entire pair. So if I want to unify a variable with this pair, then x will unify with the pair AB. The same holds true with lists. If I have a list ABC, I can unify that with a variable Y, and Y takes on the value ABC. So let's take a look at what this looks like in our code. So a pair is going to have, be a head and a tail separated by a vertical bar enclosed in brackets, and then a list is an empty list, or it's a pair where the tail is a list. And I can take advantage of the ability to unify the parts of a pair. I'll write a rule pair parts that unifies with a pair and did the head and the tail separately. So something it definitely didn't like there. So let me save that and try it again. Okay, so I'm not sure what happened there, but it seems to like that better. So now if I say pair parts A, B, C, that fails because this is not a pair. But if I say the pair 1, 2, X and Y, then you can see it unifies X with the head and Y with the tail, which is what we ex would expect based on our rule. If I give it a list, then it gives me the head and the tail. A is the head. The tail is the list with B, C, D, E. And finally,
I can use this to create a pair. Notice now these two atoms unify with this pair because the rule puts them together and the same for lists. So I can write a rule first that returns the first element in a list or a pair. And here I'll use an anonymous variable for the tail because I don't care what it is. I'll consult. So there it gets the first element of a list. And also the first element of a pair. I can write a pair predicate. I don't care about the head. I don't care about the tail. I just care that its structure is a pair. And I can write a list predicate the same way. First off, the empty list is a list. And I don't care about the head, but I do care about the tail because for this to be a list, the tail has to be a list as well. So an atom isn't a pair, but a pair is a pair, and a list is a pair. But the empty list isn't a pair, but it is a list. And of course, we would also expect that this list would be a list, but if we ask if this pair is a list, it's going to say false. But if I change B to be the empty list, it is because again, this is actually a list with just one element. That element would be A. So you'll notice again, we're using prolog's ability to unify with the structure to avoid having to put in a lot of logic to determine the truth or false of some of these statements. So how about if I write a rule at least to enlist that returns true if a list has at least two elements in it. I don't care what those elements are. I don't care what the tail is. And this will be a predicate that will tell me that there's at least two elements in the list. So I'll consult. That's true. That's false. That's also false because it's a pair. And that's true because there's at least two elements there. Again, this succeeds if it matches some list that has at least two elements. Now, I can take this and modify it so that if there's three parameter, and that's going to basically become a rule that grabs the first two elements in the list. So now, I do care about these two elements. I still don't care about the tail, though. And you can see this will unify with a list, and then the A and the B will unify with a value. So let's try that. And so you can see that that works. Let's look and see. Here we have a list with just one element. And notice that fails. It doesn't match just A. It actually fails because there's nothing to unify with B. OK, so we've seen how to find the first two elements. Now let's return the third element. Again, we don't care what the first element is, the second element. But we do care about the third element. And we don't care about the tail. So we'll make that anonymous. And again, remember, I'm using A and B and T and H. These variable names don't really matter. So let's say third element of A, B, C. And of course, again, the variables don't matter. If I have just A, B, this fails. If I have just an atom, it fails because this will only unify with a list with three elements. And then once it does, it takes that third element and unifies that with A. So expanding on what we did before, I'm going to write two different rules. One that takes three parameters. And here, I don't care about the tail. And this should look familiar. This is essentially the same as at least two in the list. So we have a singleton variable T. And again, I don't care what that is. There's only one. It's not unifying with anything. So I'll make that anonymous. And now, now again, I didn't have to fix that. My code would still work. But again, normally singleton variables, 
indicate a problem with your code. So even if they don't, you should go ahead and remove them so that the ones that are actual errors will stand out. So it's you don't want to have warnings when you consult your, your database. So we'll do first to And so we see that I could say first to one, two, three, four, five. And of course, if I was terrible, I could do I could even do this. Because again, these variable names don't matter. So even though I say second, second unifies with the first element. Just like what we saw before, if there's not enough elements, then the rule will fail. And if it's not a list, it will fail. So now I'm going to write first two with just two parameters, same rule, but instead of unifying two variables, I'm going to create a list and notice to create a list. All I do is put those values in brackets. So let me consult that fails because it's not a list. Now notice this unifies result with the list AB, which is a list comprised of the first two elements of the list. So you'll notice outside of this, where we're checking that the tail is a list, none of these clauses have anything other than a head. I mean, there's nothing there. We're using Prolog's unification ability. It's checking the format of what we're looking for to do all of this logic without having to be explicit about looking for the sizes, iterating through the list. No, we just say, hey, here's what the list looks like. Here's the two values I want. Give them to me. Ignore the rest. Here's a case where I'm saying, get these first two elements, remove the rest, put them in a list. Here's the list that you should put them in. So this is something that's a lot different than C, Java, C++, those kind of languages. You definitely want to get your head around it, though, because writing your code like this definitely simplifies your prolog code. And if you try to go back to thinking how you would do this in another language, you can get yourself into trouble. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how powerful some of the capabilities of prolog are. And in the next videos, we'll start talking about actually how to create list procedures.